I want to start by talking about that ceremony that I referenced in our uh, prayer request this morning, the ceremony to install uh, Mark Masurgian Smith as our regional executive minister that happened yesterday morning in Altoona at the Abcopad Biennial Conference. Uh, a couple things to note uh, is that he was already uh, serving in this role going back to last year. Officially, uh, he was the interim before and then officially chosen by the executive uh, committee and then affirmed by the board uh, in February, actually on Valentine's Day of this year. Uh, so this was the formal ceremony that confirmed what had already been made official, uh, which of course is useful for us because today in our text, God is going to be performing a ceremony with Abram about a covenant that he established years earlier when he was still in Ur, when he called him and told him to go to the promised land. And Abram had been living by that covenant for some time. And yet now they chose to formalize it with a ceremony. So there's a little bit of that continuity. Of course, how we go about it was a little bit different than what we're going to read here in Genesis this, this morning. Uh, at first, uh, Mark and the president, uh, the current president of the board, uh, did what we normally do for ministers and other such similar things is a bit of a call and response. Will you agree to these things, to do these things? Yes, I will, uh, and back and forth uh, sort of thing. And then we finished uh, with the part that, that has the most uh, emotional resonance, and that's the laying on of hands. Uh, you can see the picture on the left, the, uh, the room at the convention center. We had about 240, 250 folks uh, from our 280 churches, uh, which, which is, of course, less than, than every church. We never have that many but, uh, uh, people there, but it was a, a good group. Uh, I had a great time uh, interacting with my colleagues and friends. Um, and I am uh, on the right with the blue shirt in the back there uh, trying. I could not get my arm all the way to him, but I had my arm on someone who had his arm on him kind of thing, and we, uh, the transitive property kind of thing. We, we, we do that when we lay on hands. That's okay. Uh, and we prayed for him, um, and, and it was a very emotional, very, very touching moment. Um, so keep that kind of thing. But that, that, we're Americans, right? That's what we do, uh, at least those of us from the Northern European cultural background. We don't do big, uh, flowery, emotional kinds of things. We have very calm ceremonies, very, very solemn things. That's just kind of our way. Uh, and that is not what's going to happen in Genesis this, this, this morning. So let's take a look. Uh, starting in verse 7 of chapter 15, it's, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur and of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. This conversation between Abram and the Lord picks up right where we left off last week. God has just reassured Abram about his not yet born son, by taking him out and showing him the night sky and saying, so will your descendants be. We talked last week about how Abram believed God, and that was credited to him as righteousness. Now, the Lord reminds Abram that his future descendants, remember the ones that are promised to be very numerous, but don't yet exist, that they will one day inherit this whole land. In the vast scope of God's will and purpose, these descendants of Abraham will have a key role to play. And it involves this land as well. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? It's really kind of a they and not an I, because the possession of the land in question is a number of generations into the future. Famously, Abraham, when he died, only owned the plot of land that his wife was buried, that her, fun her, her tomb was. That was all he owned when he died. The rest of the land belonged to others. But Abram's question hits on an important concern. How can the distant future be known? How can Abram have any confidence in things many generations to come. 
This isn't a question of him doubting or somehow losing the faith that he just demonstrated, right? He's not doubting God. Abram does believe God, but he's as mortal and as time-bound as you or I. So he naturally has questions about how and when these things will take place. Abraham asking for a sign is a very standard move when people interact with God. Moses himself wanted a sign to show the Israelites before he agreed to be God's spokesperson. What if they don't believe that you came to me? What if they don't listen to me, he said. And then, of course, a sign to show Pharaoh. He got two signs. When the question is asked in faith, when someone says to God, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief, God responds because God is trying to help people. God wants us to believe. So the Lord said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. The nature of the sign isn't supposed to make sense to us. It's supposed to speak to Abram's ancient Near Eastern mindset to convey powerful symbolism to him in a way that his culture would embrace. The animals in question are all acceptable sacrificial animals in the rituals associated with the law of Moses. The Israelites at Sinai may have looked, may have looked at them in this light, but Abram wouldn't have because he had his own context of sacrifices in worship rituals, things that he had grown up doing before the Lord spoke to him, things that his family and his tribe, the people that he belonged to, that they would have understood about interacting with the gods, things that form his context, things that his Canaanite neighbors would have understood. Abram doesn't need to be told by God what to do with these particular animals. From the moment God gives him these instructions, get those animals, Abram knew what God intended to do with them because it's culturally understood. And so he does it. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. So unless you're already familiar with this passage of Scripture, uh, and one of the things that I like to say in Bible study is, we don't have a flannel graph for that, right? Those of you who are old school and go all the way back to Sunday school where they put the flannel graphs up, right? Am I, I'm not the only one who remembers flannel graphs, right? Uh, there was no flannel graph set for this ceremony with the half of each animal to put up there uh, because we didn't freak, freak out the children, right? So I'm pretty sure unless you are familiar with this passage, you didn't see that coming. One of the reasons why is that this particular ritual is only referenced one other time in Scripture. Imagine that. We read Jeremiah 34 already to that reference about the covenant and a calf cut in two and people walking between it. That is the only time that Scripture talks about this moment. Other than that, God's covenant with Abraham, the covenant is mentioned dozens of times in the Old Testament and New Testament. They're always talking about God's promises to Abraham. But the actual ceremony that sealed it is only mentioned one other time. Actually, that's not this ceremony, but a similar ceremony. We don't have descriptions of things like this in the surviving ancient Near Eastern documents. We don't have a Babylonian ceremony, Egyptian ceremony, a Hittite ceremony that that bear, bear similar resemblances. And Genesis doesn't take the time to explain the symbolism involved here. They just tell us what happened. Moses is like, everybody knows what this means. He doesn't bother to explain it. So that's a word of caution, right? We shouldn't be dogmatic about what all of the individual pieces of this mean when we have so little information to go by. However, the the symbolism 
really seems pretty straightforward. Given that the Hebrew verb used in verse 18, we'll get to there in a minute, is to cut. Verse 18 will say Abraham made a covenant. The Hebrew is the Lord, excuse me, the Lord cut a covenant with Abram. The verb is cutting. This bit of theater is how Abram's culture would have sealed the deal. It's not all that dissimilar from the kinds of blood oaths that we might be familiar with from Northern European or Native American culture. Uh, the idea of perhaps cutting your hand uh, to seal a deal, maybe seal, having a handshake with the other guy who's cut his hand uh, so that you, you make it solemn. The animals cut in two here serve as a very vivid reminder of what should happen to either party if they break the covenant. Our best understanding, then, is that this arrangement of three cut-in-half animals and two dead birds to top it off was meant to drive home this point. Let this be done to whomsoever breaks this covenant. That's, that's kind of vivid. Right? I mean, this is, this is some serious business. This is not the laying on of hands. There was no blood involved yesterday uh, uh, when we, uh, for the ceremony for Reverend Mark. Uh, we, we simply prayed for him and put our hands on him. No, no, no blood was involved. This is a serious picture here. We're cutting these animals in half and letting the blood flow together and then uh, making it well known. So in other words, if you back out of or break or fail to fulfill this covenant, you're not going to get out of it by filing chapter 11, right? You're not going to be able to run to bankruptcy court to get out of this. There's going to be no, no there aren't going to be any no-fault divorces here. You cannot get out of this covenant, not without blood. It should go without saying uh, that God cannot be held accountable if he breaks the covenant. Nothing and no one has the right or the power to sit in judgment of God. He wouldn't be God otherwise. But God was willing to symbolically put his life on the line as a way to drive home the point to Abram of just how serious this covenant with him really is. On the positive side of things, of course, God doesn't need anyone to hold him to his word. The holy and righteous character of God ensures that he will keep its, his word all on its own. Let's continue. It says, then the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. The sentence jumps out at us because it literally interrupts the ceremony between God and Abram. If the birds are meant to be symbolic of something, and I read a lot of different things that, about what that might be, perhaps they represent evil in general, trying to get between God and Abraham. Or maybe they are supposed to represent Egypt or all the other nations. Genesis doesn't offer us an explanation as to what the birds are all about. They're either symbolic birds or just birds. Uh, either way... The covenant ceremony has one important step left in it. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. I would say things are growing more ominous. We've already cut animals in two uh, to show that we're meaning serious business here, uh, but now we've got a thick and dreadful darkness. Before we find out what is left, God's going to make a brief speech to Abram. And we're going to spend most of our time looking at God's words. But a fun time is not normally described as a thick and dreadful darkness, right? Uh, that's not a, a term you would use. So, this, so hold that thought, that that is the state that Abram is in, uh, in this moment. And let's hear the words that God has to say to him first. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. 
before God does his part in the covenant sealing ceremony. He wants Abram to understand that the future is both known and planned out by God with respect to his descendants. What will happen in three generations when Joseph and his brothers end up in Egypt will not be a fluke. Verse 16 will tell us one of the reasons why God will choose to remove Abraham's descendants from the promised land for 400 years. Although that news isn't going to be pleasant for him to hear, there is a purpose to all this. They will sojourn in the land. We, of course, know that they're talking about Egypt. It won't be an unpleasant time there in the beginning, but it will eventually become horrific, leading to the people crying out to the Lord for deliverance and God sending Moses to carry that deliverance out. Being in a foreign land for 400 years isn't the quickest way to give the possession of the promised land to Abraham's descendants, right? This seems like the slow way. Uh, Abraham asked him, how will I know that my descendants will inherit this land? And God says, well, I'll tell you. For 400 years, they'll be somewhere else. So we're not going straight there. Speed was never God's priority here. He has other things that are more important. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. The plagues listed in the book of Exodus vividly recount this, this outpouring of God's wrath, as well as the plunder the Israelites will take with them as they leave. This example of God's meeting out justice reminds us that while Abraham and his descendants are God's chosen people, the ones on whom he will lavish grace and demonstrate love, God still remains vigilant over all the peoples of the earth. All must answer for their failures to seek and obey God. And that day will be the time that it's visited upon the Egyptians. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. It seems a small point in comparison given that Abram is on the home stretch of his time here on earth. But it's only human to be concerned about our own stories, twists, and turns. Even when we're dealing with globally relevant events, even when global things are happening, we still care what happens to us. That's only natural. It serves as yet another reminder that the will of God encompasses both the lives of ordinary people like you and me, alongside the fate of nations. God is capable of caring about, and he certainly does, both the small and the great. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The sojourn in a foreign land, Egypt, will come to an end. That news is of prime importance to Abram because it will be the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise to give his descendants this land. The bigger picture here offers an explanation as to why that promise has to wait more than 400 years. It also shows us an insight into how God's justice works, at least in this one example. So let's talk about it. The Amorites are one of the Canaanite tribes currently inhabiting the land alongside Abram. They had similar cultural and religious practices as all of the other tribes in the area. So this evaluation of them could have been made of the Canaanite people in general. So what does God have to say about them? Now we're not given any specifics here about their moral conduct, but the conclusion about it is ominous. We are told that they are piling up offenses against God, that the debt is accumulating. The debt of wickedness is growing rapidly in each generation, and it's heading toward a point of no return in the future. At the time of the Exodus, 
more than 400 years from now, they will have reached the point where God's wrath is at hand. And the final judgment against them will begin by the hand of Joshua and the Israelites. What can we learn from the example of the Amorites? Among the many possible takeaways are these four. Number one, God is fully aware of the future. To God, the future is no less real than the present. Therefore, there can be no surprises to God. In fact, God's will and his purpose are set from now until the end of time. So if you want to talk about how this affects free will, uh, the short answer is that foreknowledge is not causation. God knowing the future is not what makes the future happen. The longer version of that answer is a 500-year conversation between Calvinists and Arminians going back to the Reformation. We're not going to get into that here. Uh, but it doesn't take away the free will and the choices that the Amorites and the rest of the Can 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 Canaanites are going to make between now and that time of judgment. Second thing, God chooses to reveal his judgment against individuals in Genesis. We saw that with Cain in chapter 4. Towards towns, we'll see that with Sodom in chapter 18. Towards nations, here with the Amorites in chapter 15. And to toward whole regions, towards the earth, in the story of Noah in chapter, chapters 8 and 9. In Genesis, God shows us that on every level in this life. Now, we are typically not aware of these actions on God's part, but Genesis demonstrates a willingness to take action against wickedness here and now. One other note is that Exodus will repeatedly show that this willingness includes judging his own people when they sin individually and collectively. So this is a part of that pattern. The third thing we could take away from this is that the effects of sin are not confined to the lives of those who commit them. Sin can affect future generations, plural. Not just the next, your kids, but your grandkids, your great-grandkids, and on and on. We may not want to contemplate this hard truth, but sin can have a ripple effect beyond its origin. In this, it will be one generation that experiences God's judgment. Even though multiple generations contributed to that tally that led to it. Now I want to give you some good news. The good news is righteousness works the exact same way. Righteousness spills out beyond its origin and... Righteousness is more powerful and longer lasting than wickedness ever could be. Fourth thing to take away from this, and here is where it might hit home a little bit. I've heard people for decades, and I kid you not, decades have been saying in my hearing or to me, uh, that God's wrath upon the United States of America for this, that, or the other sin, and that that changes from time to time what they think the sin is, is imminent. Yesterday, someone told me that the seals were broken, the horsemen of the apocalypse were already marching, and the end was nigh. And I was like, all right. <laughs> That's an interesting uh, uh, viewpoint. They speak as if they can see and evaluate the sum total of this land's wickedness and righteousness. As if I'm aware of all the wickedness and all the righteousness and I can weigh it. As if they have the ability to weigh those things according to divine justice. And let me say to you firmly that all of that is hogwash. That was a term I can use in church. It's nuts. It's not real. Because you do not know. And I do not know. Unless God chooses to reveal his will, 
We do not know it in things like this. FYI, if God is going to reveal his will, will about America, he's not going to do it through a self-appointed prophet or apostle uh, making YouTube videos that are clickbait so they can get rich. That's not who God's going to choose to work with, even though that's who is informing a lot of this opinion these days. Or I saw it on a YouTube video. Oh, good Lord. We cannot know God's will for individuals, families, churches, towns, regions, countries, or the world in specific. So we need to stop listening to people who claim to know what God is about to do about the United States of America or the church or any entity that they say, oh, this is what God's about to do. You don't know. We do, however, know God's will in general for all of those groups, for me, for my family, for my church, for my community, for my country, and for the world, because it's the exact same thing. To expand the kingdom of God through the truth of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is God's will for every one of us, for this church, for this town, for this country, and the world. And it always will be until Christ returns, and that day is going to come as a surprise. So our calling and purpose, if and when God uh, is to be a part of that gospel proclamation, if and when God chooses to judge any of those entities, that's his business, and he'll take care of it. Bit of a tangent there, uh, but that's the kind of thing that just gets to me. Uh, and it happened yesterday, after I'd already written this. Somebody said something. I was like, ah, there's another one. Sigh. All right, I'll move on. Uh, 17. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. That's what this particular 19th century art is trying to depict, the blazing torch. So the narrative is resuming here with the culmination of this covenant cutting ceremony. The English translation is about as clear a picture as you're going to get because the original Hebrew is an unusual picture too. This is, this is what we've got. So as far as we can tell, this fire here represents the presence of God. Light and fire being the most common ways that God's manifested, the manifestation of God's presence is depicted in Scripture. The fire moves between the two sides of the animals. As far as we can tell, that's what either one or both parties, we're not sure, uh, in these ceremonies did to demonstrate how serious the covenant is. So if Abram also walked through it, the text doesn't say that he did, but if he did, imagine walking between those two sides in all of that blood. Would have been all over his sandals, all over uh, his robes. I don't know about you, but walking between the carcasses would impress upon me, I really ought to keep this covenant. This one's for serious. Right? On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. That was a lot of ites. Here in verse 18 is where we get that phrase, the Lord cut a covenant with Abram. That's the Hebrew verb. We've got a similar idiom in English, actually, when you say that you cut a deal with someone. But it doesn't have this blood-soaked ground to drive the point home. The geographic area described here is larger than the greatest extent of David and Solomon's kingdom. It was never this big. In essence, the whole 
of the promised land will belong to Abram's, Abraham's descendants. He's telling him from Egypt to the river. In other words, all of it will be theirs. This promise has seen partial fulfillment in history. But as far as we understand, we have yet to see the fullness of this and will not until Christ returns and establishes his millennial kingdom with Jerusalem as his capital. There were 10 tribes listed here inhabiting the land in Abram's day, a good symbolic round number of 10. They were not all exactly the same, of course, else they wouldn't be distinct tribes, but sadly they all shared in the immorality that was even now storing up God's wrath against them. Those living now would not feel it in this life, but in Joshua's day, the Lord would pour it out beginning with Jericho. In the end, we have here a powerful ceremony full of symbolism, tailor-made to Abram's cultural framework, one that we too can see demonstrated how very real God's co commitment was, is, and always will be with respect to his promises to Abram Abraham and his descendants. Three thoughts of application coming out of this text. Number one, the promise of a land to inherit was foundationally linked to the promise to Abram of a son. First the son, then the land. They were together and they had to be together in God's will. Number two, God chose to use Abram's cultural understanding to formalize this covenant. God was willing to meet Abram on the ground that was familiar to him. It's an amazing example of God's condescension, his outreach. Thirdly, the reminder of the story of the Amorites tells us something we already knew. The wages of sin, whether we're talking about an individual or a nation, they might be delayed in God's will. We might not see the judgment but they're never denied, not unless they're forgiven. All right, as always, we will go to the Lord in prayer.